I'd like to invite your attention this morning to the gospel as penned by the beloved physician Luke, Luke chapter 22. I want to thank all of our brothers who have led our devotion on this morning. Uh, Luke chapter 22, and if you will, meet me at verse number 14 in Luke chapter 22. We are studying this day some information as it relates to what some call Easter, some call Resurrection Sunday, some call Passover. I hope to inform your spiritual minds so that you might use terminology that is consistent with what thus saith the Lord, as well as challenge perhaps some of your traditions and some of your thoughts on this day. I want you to make sure that you take notes. Uh, feel free to check and double check the scriptures that I give you. Make sure that you do due diligence in recognizing these are not the words of the pastor, but these are the words of the master. In Luke chapter 22, if you will, beginning in verse number 14, for emphasis sake, we will again read the devotional scripture that was read earlier. The Bible says in Luke 22 in verse number 14, and when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, this, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new Testament in my blood, which is shed for many. Again, the latter part of verse 19, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Beloved, the subject for this morning, remembering what should not be forgotten. Remembering what should not be forgotten. We understand the value of memory. And in order to make sure that we don't forget certain things, we honor those things with dates on our calendar. We honor those things by mentally or even writing down dates that should be recalled because certain dates have significance to all of us. For example, we remember birthdays. We don't want to forget the day that we were born, the day that a loved one was born. And certainly we mark specific birthdays as milestones in a person's life. And so we send out birthday cards. We have birthday celebrations because we don't want to forget the day someone was born. We remember anniversaries, be it the anniversary of when we started a job, the anniversary of our marriage, or other days that are significant to us. Uh, we also remember holidays. We like to honor days. For example, we like to remember the Martin Luther King holiday. We like to remember Independence Day, also known as the 4th of July. We have uh, Veterans Day, other uh, days that are significant in our history. And so we mark those days 
as a day to remember. The reason why so much emphasis is put on memory is because we have an interesting way in which our brain processes uh, information. Uh, on a daily basis, we come into contact with a lot of visual and a lot of auditory or hearing cues. And in that, we filter out a lot of things, but then there are things that we commit uh, to our memory. But we also have a problem with our memory in that we have what I call selective amnesia. And that is we conveniently remember what we want to remember, but then we filter out stuff that we probably need to remember. Uh, as an example, when we uh, think back, we may think about somebody who owes us money. And it may have been 20, 30, 40 years ago, and we never forget uh, the money that they owed us. But then we can owe a debt to somebody and seem to selectively have amnesia and can't remember uh, that just as somebody is indebted to us, we are indebted to someone as well. We see an example of this in the Gospels, and I'm laying the foundation for Luke chapter 22. Uh, but I want us to look uh, briefly at Matthew chapter 18 and show you how we selectively uh, remember and how we selectively forget. And that's why I call it selective amnesia. You remember the person in uh, Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 18, and somewhere around verse number 23, he tells the story about a king who takes into account uh, that which his servants owe him. And one of his servants uh, was commanded uh, to be sold, not only him, but his wife and his children and all that the servant had uh, was to be sold so that the king could be repaid. And it's in verse number 26, where in Matthew 18, the Bible says, the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. In verse 27, then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Now, when you drop down to verse 28, the same person who had just been forgiven of all of uh, what he owed, uh, who had just received some mercy and some compassion, found someone who owed him. And you are familiar with the story, the man who owed him, he laid his hands on him, took him by the throat in verse 28 saying, I want you to pay me, I want my money. And in verse 29, that servant fell down at his feet and, and asked for patience and said, I'll pay you, uh, just bear with me. And in verse 30, it is said that this man had no patience. He, he commanded him uh, to pay him everything that was owed him. Otherwise, he would cast him into prison until the debt should be paid. Uh, I want us to reflect on Matthew 18 as we consider Luke chapter 22, because I want us to see uh, why God put a memorial in the worship experience, because uh, we selectively remember what we want to remember, and we forget things easily that we probably should remember. Uh, as is the case in Matthew chapter 18, we see a man who seemingly uh, forgets the mercy that he had been given and does not extend to another uh, the, the same mercy that he had. And somewhere in his mind, he should have been reminded and been motivated by the idea that uh, he had been given mercy, he should grant mercy. Now, the reason, uh, as we go back to Luke 22, the reason God instituted the Lord's Supper is because God knows how we tend to forget. We, we remember some things and then we forget other things. And so God instituted a memorial 
so that we would not forget. We, we could not be guilty of selective amnesia. We could not be guilty of uh, remembering stuff we probably need to forget and forgetting stuff we need to remember. And so the Lord instituted in Luke chapter 22, this supper, this memorial feast, so that we can remember what should not be forgotten, which is the sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary. Now, understand this from uh, a different perspective, because today is uh, a day that has been called uh, Easter Sunday. And, and I want to challenge you today, and, and I have preached this and taught this uh, over the years, and people get upset, people get uncomfortable, uh, people get defensive, uh, people have strong opinions, and, and I'm not going to back down from what thus saith the Lord. Now, if you want to take issue, uh, take issue with what the Bible says versus what uh, Brother Gibbs says. I want us to look at some things and understand some things about this memorial uh, that the Lord instituted so that we can understand what it is and we can also know what it is not. Uh, the first thing that we want to recognize and why the Lord instituted this memorial, number one, is so that we can remember, number two, so that we can reflect, and number three, so that we can reevaluate. There are three reasons at minimum for the Lord's Supper to remember, to reflect, and to reevaluate. Let's talk first about the word remember, the idea that this is a time to remember. When the Lord instituted this memorial, it is because he wants us to understand uh, that he went to Calvary's cross on our behalf. And if there's anything we ought not ever forget, it is the sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary. It is the idea that God loved us while we were sinners, that light came into the world to expose and rid the world of darkness, that God demonstrated his love to us, that God brought about atonement and reconciliation from sin, that by way of Jesus Christ, we get access to eternity with God the Father, that reconciliation has been made between heaven and earth, that Jesus who came as both God and man at the same time, because he was God, could hold God's hand. Because he was man, he was able to hold man's hand and put God and man back together again and restore the fellowship that had been lost. Remember, the Bible declares that sin has separated us from God. And so Jesus came to pay for those sins, to sacrifice for us, and to bring about reconciliation so that we move from a separated relationship to a eternal and eternal fellowship with the Father. Now, in remembering this, it is important for us to understand something and put your seatbelts on because you're about to get uncomfortable. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that some folk are going to take issue, but, but, but again, take issue with the word of God. One of the problems that we have with this day that we call Easter is that the memorial we're supposed to remember was not instituted as an annual memorial. It was instituted as a weekly memorial uh, for all practical purposes, celebrating uh, Resurrection Sunday, celebrating the Passover, or as some of you all say, Easter, and we're going to challenge that in just a second, but the celebration was not instituted as a means of an annual uh, memorial. It was instituted as a weekly memorial. So to single out one day, of the year is an improper biblical basis on which to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. God wanted us to remember him 
on a weekly basis and not on an annual basis. In Acts chapter 20 and verse number seven, the Bible says, and upon the first day of the week, every week's got a first day. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continue his speech until midnight. We see that the institution of the Lord's Supper, the memorial, the remembering of Jesus the Christ and his experience at Calvary, the apostolic example was not an annual example, it was a weekly example. It's not a monthly example. It's not semi-annual. It's not quarterly. It is weekly. Therefore, in proper worship to God, our focus on the resurrection should not be an annual event. It is supposed to be, according to the Bible, a weekly event. Now, let's look at some other problems and how we remember the Lord. Let's talk about this concept that we call Easter. First of all, the word Easter is an inaccurate term for the Passover. I know some of you say, well, Acts chapter 12 and verse number four, uh, it says Easter. Well, that depends on the version of the Bible that you're reading, because Acts chapter 12 and verse number four uh, is not talking about uh, the word Easter. It's talking about the idea of the Passover. You all remember the Passover is the Old Testament uh, narrative where uh, the death plague came through Egypt and those who had the blood on the lentil post, that death as it came through Egypt, death passed over uh, their house. And, and so the Passover was a memorial celebration that uh, the Jews had as a reminder of the experience that their ancestors had been through in going from slavery to uh, freedom in the promised land. The word Easter in the King James is an unfortunate translation. It should not be the word Easter. It should be the word Passover. Now, some may argue, say, well, brother preacher, uh, what's wrong with using the word Easter? The problem in the word Easter is that it is rooted in that which is inconsistent with the Bible. Uh, Easter is rooted in fables and in traditions, such as an Easter bunny and dressing up kids uh, in particular clothing on this special day. What Satan does is that he allows us a fabled paganistic version of the day so that our understanding is filtered through uh, lies and tradition as opposed to what's written in the word of God. The word of God uh, intends for the New Testament church to memorialize, to remember the Passover, so to speak, on a weekly uh, basis. The problem with our traditions is that those traditions are rooted in paganistic thought. For example, when we talk about the uh, Easter bunny, the rabbit in paganism is a sexual symbol of fertility. And then the those in Babylonia, uh, they believe the aid to have fallen from heaven and have birthed the goddess uh, Astorte, and Astorte is where we get the word Easter. Uh, they believe that this goddess uh, of fertility was hatched when this egg fell from heaven and this goddess was hatched from the egg. And so when we start to talk about uh, Easter, which is not a biblical term, when we talk about a rabbit, which is not a biblical term or concept uh, from uh, the Passover or the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, when we talk about the A, what we're doing is instilling within our children that which is inconsistent with the word of God. We are teaching uh, paganism and fables and traditions that take us away from Bible teaching to that which is consistent with satanic 
and demonic influence. Now, I have said this before over the years, parents argue up and down, it's harmless, it's innocent, what does it hurt? I'm going to tell you, it hurts your relationship with God. It hurts your fellowship with God. It hurts your worship to God because anytime you do anything inconsistent with godliness, then you are out of fellowship with God and your fellowship needs to be restored by repentance, confession, and a change in those behaviors that have upset the fellowship in the first place. Now, I know I'm upsetting some folk and that's all right, uh, but you can argue with the Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, I want to show you some things in the scripture so that we can understand how God feels about things that he did not sanction. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, I want you to notice some things about uh, God's position on paganism and idolatry. And if what you do, what you practice, and what you call it is not consistent with the Bible, then it is sinful in nature. We in the Church of Christ, we teach call Bible things by Bible names. We say the name of the church should be Church of Christ because that's what we read in the Bible. Everything that we do, we say it, we need to have book, chapter, and verse. Well, if you're going to promote the concept of a bunny, if you're going to promote the concept of eggs, if you're going to promote the concept of Easter, give me book, chapter, and verse. I can give you book, chapter, and verse that says that those things are pagan, those things are idolatry, those things are sinful to God. I want you to take notes on these scriptures. I want you to understand them and read them. And if you get upset, don't get upset with the minister, get upset with the master. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse number one, the Bible says, these are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do of the land, which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it. All the days that you live upon the earth, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. Notice what God is teaching here. Do not be influenced by the world. And when you go into the world and the world hands you tradition, the world hands you paganism, the world hands you that which cannot be found in the word of God. He says, I want you to overthrow it. I want you to tear it down. I want you to burn it. I want you to hew it down, destroy it because it's not consistent with what is right written. If we were to change the frequency of how we take the Lord's Supper, if we were to change how we sing, if we were to change the name of the church, uh, people would get upset and say, brother preacher, that's not right. It's not written. Well, I say the same thing to you when it comes to our traditional view of this day we call a holiday. If it's not found in the Bible, then we cannot go against what is written. We can't add to God's word. We can't take away God's word. If you want to celebrate the the resurrection of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it's upon the first day of the week that we are commanded uh, to remember what should not be forgotten. Let me ask you to think of this because somebody's going to say, well, Brother Preacher, I think this is harmless. And I know somebody's going to say that because I have preached for years about this subject matter. And people say this, they're very defensive. Let the little kids have some fun. What does it hurt? They don't know anything about all of that. These parents seem to forget that the Bible teaches us to rear up a child in the way that they should go. The Bible teaches us that we are to teach God's statutes, not man's traditions, not man's paganistic views. We are to teach our children. And so maybe the reason why the world doesn't have more people advancing the cause of Christ is because we are so happy to sell uh, our traditions that we're not teaching the word of God. Give me and my family, we've done this for years. What's wrong with it? I want you to think about this from a biblical perspective. There's a man in the Bible. I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 15. And you see this in 1 Kings chapter 15. There was a man by the name of Asa. 
Asa had a hard job before him. Because sometimes we say, well, Brother Gibbs, blood is thicker than water, and we go along with stuff in our family. Asa reigned over Judah. And one of the things Asa did in his administration that many folk can't do today is that Asa set his grandmother down. Now, if you're in the King James Version, you're going to see the word mother. But if you study this in the Hebrew, the word uh, actually references his, mother, his grandmother. In 1 Kings chapter 15, notice, if you would, verse number 9. In 1 Kings chapter 15, I just want you to understand what thus saith the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 15, starting at verse number 9. The Bible says, in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. And 40 and one years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name, again, that's his grandmother. His mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Absalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyesight of the Lord, as did, his, as did David, his father, uh, now, I want you to notice something uh, in verse number 11. Asa didn't do that which was convenient. He didn't do that which was traditional. He didn't do that which was passed down uh, simply from the idea of human traditions. Asa did that which was right in the eyesight of the Lord as did David, his father. And again, this reference to his parent, David was not his father. David was a grandfather. In verse number 12, what did he do? And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. And also Maacah, his mother, again, his grandmother, even her, he removed his grandmother. I need y'all to see this. He removed his grandmother from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove and Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Kidron. Now, I don't know if Asa's grandmama could cook. I don't know if she ever invited him over to dinner again, if she ever made him apple pie, if she ever knitted him a sweater or a blanket. I could imagine that the family reunion was inconvenient. It was hard. Can you imagine Asa showing up at the family gathering, at the fr family fish fry, a card playing session? or the picnic, the 4th of July celebration, whatever it was. Could you imagine Asa showing up? And not only does he have to face his grandmother, but he has to look at his parents, his cousins, his uncles and aunts. And when he shows up, everybody looks at him and say, that's the man that set grandmama down. Don't he understand? Blood is thicker than water. How dare he remove grandmama? That is his grandmama, and he removes her uh, from being queen. Why did Asa do that? Because grandmama was not practicing what was written in the scriptures. She was not doing that which was right in the eyesight of the Lord, and Asa was not willing to sacrifice his God relationship for his grandmother's tradition. Let me show this to you one more time because we need the Bible to prove the Bible so that people can say, this is what thus saith the Lord. I want you to turn back in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 5. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, I love this story. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, I want you to notice something here. Uh, God does not accept putting anything equal to him. Remember, the Bible teaches that God will not share his glory. Anything that God considers idolatry or pagan in nature is not equal to him, and God will destroy it. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, there is this story. I love this story. I get excited every time I read this because this lets me know that, that God is large and God is in charge. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, and verse number one, the Bible says, and the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now let's understand something for those who don't know. The ark of God, this represents God. This is what God 
has allowed to be a physical representation of his spiritual being for the children of Israel. Understand this, the ark of God does not replace God, but is authorized by God to be a symbol of him. This is what God has approved, not what man has passed down. The house of Dagon represents paganism and idolatry, that which is not equal to God. Notice verse number three, and when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, and they took Dagon, notice this, uh, and they set him up again in his place. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left uh, to him. Now, here's what's so exciting about this. They tried to equal uh, the ark with a Phyllis, with a uh, the Philistines uh, uh, put this Ark of God into the house of Dagon. The house of Dagon, again, represents idolatry, paganism. And, and God had to show that since the Ark represents me, you're not going to put an idol next to me as if we are equal. So when they come back in, uh, the idol is bowed down to God. They raise the idol up. God would bow the idol back down and said, I tell you what, since y'all don't get it, when you come in here in the morning, the next time you see uh, Dagon, Dagon is going to be falling uh, to his face. Uh, his head and his hands are going to be cut off and only the stump of Dagon was left. God was showing even through the ark that nothing, no one is equal to me. So we have to be very careful about attributing things to God that are consistent that are inconsistent, that is, with godliness. So be very careful in how we remember uh, the Lord. The second thing is that we take this memorial to reflect on God. When we partake of the communion, when we read traditionally 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting uh, generally at verse number 23, uh, we have to understand that this is a time of reflection. When we think about Jesus having died, the gospel message is that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4 teaches us the defining of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we take of the Lord's Supper, this is a time to reflect on the fact that Jesus died for us. He was buried and he rose. At the time when we partake, when we break the cracker, when we hear the crunch of the cracker in our mouths, that is a time to be in awe, to humble ourselves, to give reverence, to give respect, to pay homage to the broken body of Jesus, to reflect on the fact that they beat him, they pierced him into the side. They drove nails through three layers of skin. His blood came forth. The Lord's Supper is a time for us to reflect on God. It is a time for us to think about who God is, what he did for us, how he loved us. He demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The communion is a time of reflection. It is not a time to think about your checkbook or your grocery shopping list. It's not a time to play goo goo eyes with the babies in the church. It's not a time to be criticizing what someone is wearing. It's not a time for us to allow our minds to wander and to stray. It is our time to reflect on the fact that God has been good to us. Even if you don't have money, even if you don't have the house you want, the car you want, the wardrobe you want, the food you want, or any other thing, God has been so good to us that he has given to us heaven by the way of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10 and verse 15, Jesus says, I laid down my life for the sheep. Jesus gave his life for us. 
We have access to heaven. We hope, trust, and pray that we survive this coronavirus pandemic. But if we don't, we are promised heaven up above, not because we are perfect, not because we give so much, not because we are so righteous, but because Jesus died at Calvary's cross and he said it is is finished. God's perfect plan of redemption has been finished. It is now in place. Man gets to go to heaven, not so that we can enjoy eternally all of the stuff that we did here on earth, all of that stuff we say at funerals about Mama's up in heaven sowing angels' wings and daddy's up in heaven planting a garden because that's what he loved to do down here. And, and uncle so-and-so loved to play golf. He's up there playing golf and big mama's playing card, all that other nonsense that we say at funerals. No, we get to be in heaven to enjoy fellowship with the Father, to sing praises for all of eternity, to be able to see all of the heroes of faith, to have conversation with Abraham, and to be able to talk with, with, with God's people and talk to Nehemiah and talk to Paul and talk to Peter. That's what heaven is all about. It is worship every day, all day for all of eternity. If you think worship is long here on earth, if you've got to be made to come to worship now, you would not like heaven because heaven is Sunday every day. And that's what we ought to reflect on at the Lord's Supper. Then lastly, not only do we remember and reflect but the Lord's Supper should cause us to reevaluate ourselves, to think about the sacrifice that the Lord made for us. As you partake of that cracker and think about his broken body as you drink that juice and reflect on his shed blood, what thoughts have you had since you last took the Lord's Supper? How have you been talking? How have you been walking? The Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that scripture that we love to read, something so important about reevaluating ourselves, something that we might miss in our traditional reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I like verse 28 because the Bible says, let a man examine himself. One of the unfortunate things is that church can often be a place of cruelty and criticism instead of a place of humble self-evaluation to think about the idea that God has been so good to me that he gave me access to heaven. How am I acting? How am I talking? How am I walking? How are my choices in comparison to God's word, will, and way for my life? To reflect on Jesus is to remember, to reevaluate, to reflect on what he's done for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and 10, the Bible says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. One of the things that brings godly sorrow is when we start remembering and examining ourselves and thinking about what God has done for us. We ought to leave the Lord's Supper wanting to be a better person wanting to think right and talk right and be right because it's just overwhelming that the God of this universe would come in the form of a mere man, allow himself to be born in humble conditions, to think about Jesus who allow himself to be mistreated, to be spit on, 
that the God of justice suffered injustice at the hands of Pilate, that the great God of this universe found himself subject to men who hung him on a cross, having jailed him and beat him, finding himself even before the cross, his soul being in agony and sorrow. He's in the garden of Gethsemane praying, Father, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. When you think about what Jesus has done, it ought to change our hearts and change our minds because God has done too much for us to repay him with lives of sin, transgressions, traditions, paganistic views. Is that really how we want to say thank you to God? Let me ask you to think of this as we prepare to close this message. Suppose you or someone you love gave an organ to save another person's life. How would you feel if your child died and you donated your child's heart that someone else could live? And you happen to be in a restaurant someday and you see the person who received the heart of your child and they're in the smoking section and they're just smoking one cigarette after another and you know your child's heart was given so that that person could live. How would that make you feel? How would it make you feel if you donated a kidney and you happen upon a person who received that kidney and they're getting drunk, drinking as if they have no regard for the fact that their lives were saved by the donation of a kidney? If you can fathom that thinking, then think about how God feels when his son went to the cross, experienced cruelty at the hands of humanity. And then we allow our minds to drift into sinful thoughts. We cuss, we fuss, we gossip, we put people down. We walk any kind of way. We come to church when we want to come to church. We get upset over little things. We get hung up on hangups. We take our significant existence and indulge in insignificant things. How does God feel when he donated the life of Jesus and we give credit to a bunny, to an egg? We wrap ourselves in tradition. How does God feel when he instituted a supper, a memorial to be honored on a weekly basis? and we give credence to an annual event that we should take just as seriously every Sunday as we do this one time of year. We need to remember what should not be forgotten, which is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who hung, bled, and died so that we might have a right to the tree of life. We need to remember him. We need to reflect on him. And we need to reevaluate ourselves. Every time we're at the Lord's table, we need to come back a little bit better because we have been humbled and we are in awe of the greatness of our God. Again, I invite you to study the scriptures. Take some time to study traditions, the origins of what we practice, I'm not asking you to determine if you like it. I'm not asking you if you're comfortable with it. I'm not asking you if you're familiar with it because it's your tradition. I'm asking you to evaluate those things in view of what thus saith the Lord. And you don't have to make your case to me. Whatever your conclusion, remember, you have to answer to God. May he bless you as we prepare 
same when I asked Brother Gerald to come on. And 